Uh, what I'm going to do today, I, I was considering starting, uh, I was going to at church today, I was going to start off 1 Timothy, the household of God, but um, start that series. I wanted to be in the church setting, so obviously I'm not starting that series today, and actually I'm scratching my head, kind of going back and forth of whether next Sunday to begin the 1 Timothy series or to dive into Nehemiah. I haven't decided yet. So we're just kind of looking, I don't know, maybe God's telling me something. Maybe 1 Timothy is not time right now, but we'll see where we go. It's either going to be 1 Timothy or, or the book of Nehemiah starting next week. But what I'm going to do, since Wednesday, we had some technical difficulties Wednesdays, and I apologize for that. We didn't get the service up on air, and it worked out so that today I'm going to start our, our series that we'll be doing on Wednesday nights. I'm going to start with Daniel chapter 1, and... Um, just the prophecies of Daniel, what they tell us about the end times. And I'll pick up this series beginning with this Wednesday in church, and we'll be doing this series on Wednesday night. But I wanted to introduce it to you and bring it in to you tonight, um, today, um, of what we're going to be doing on Wednesday. So <clears throat> just want to start off by saying this. In the Bible, there are two types of covenants within the Bible. First, there's what we call an unconditional covenant. And this unconditional covenant is the one of Genesis 15 and Genesis 12 and Genesis 18 that God makes with Abraham. You see, it's called an unconditional covenant, and here's why. God caused, caused Abraham to be in a deep, deep sleep. And then God made the covenant himself with Abraham while he was in this deep sleep. Listen, God initiated it, God made it, and God will fulfill it. Abraham had nothing to do with this covenant so what that means is God takes full responsibility for the fulfillment of this covenant, an unconditional covenant. And what that means for us is very simple. It means that sending the Savior and blessing the nations of Genesis, God tells Abraham in Genesis 12, and blessing the nations and the families of the world solely rest upon him. We have nothing to do with salvation besides making the decision to accept his path, which is Jesus Christ. Salvation begins, it ends, and it is accomplished by God and God alone. And therefore, that's some good news for us in the unconditional covenant. Therefore, we can be sure that we are saved to the uttermost. And then the second type of covenant is called a conditional covenant. It's like the one that God made to Moses and Israel in Deuteronomy 28. And, and a lot of times when you see, and a lot of people scratch their head and they have questions about this, and you see this in, un, in the conditional covenants, but you don't see it in the condition, unconditional covenants. You see things like, if then. In other words, in Deuteronomy 28, what God told Israel and told uh, Moses was this. If Israel walked in the ways of God, then he was going to bless them, and the land was going to be theirs. But if Israel abandoned God, then he would curse them, and he would kick them out of the land. Well, in Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 14, you see the blessings for obedience, and then in verses 15 through 68 of Deuteronomy 28, you see the curses for disobedience. And at times, the nation of Israel, they briefly display periods of obedience, but overall, the history of Israel is filled with disobedience and abandonment of God. Now, the period of Judges, we fast forward a little bit, the period of Judges gives us the appalling evidence of Israel's decline. And the height of obedience is seen during the reign of King David, which we just finished that series, series a couple weeks ago on, on Sundays. But even David's history is tarnished with many failures. Then, fast forward some more. After the death of Solomon, what happens is you have one kingdom, the Israel, the 12 tribes, and after the death of Solomon, the nation splits. It splits into the northern kingdom, which is known as Israel, and then the southern kingdom, which is Judah. Each kingdom, northern and southern, they both had 20 kings. Northern, 20 kings, southern. The northern kingdom only had kings that did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And the southern kingdom, they only had eight, listen, eight kings that did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. And those eight kings still had their issues. And what made the difference in those kings that did right in the eyes of the Lord? They saw after the Lord with all their heart. They were like David. They were men. Even when they messed up, they were men after God's own heart. The kings of the southern and northern kingdoms were always compared to David, a man after God's heart. Either they followed a man after God's own heart or they did evil and they weren't. And the and kings were also compared to Jeroboam the first. 
the first king of the northern kingdom that did what was right in his own eyes and did not seek the Lord. And therefore, since you had so much wickedness and evil during this time, the northern kingdom was carried off into captivity in 722 BC by the Assyrians. And the southern kingdom, which is where the Judah and Jerusalem was, known as Judah, the southern kingdom was carried off into captivity in 605 BC by Nebuchadnezzar to Babylon. Now Babylon, let's talk about Babylon because that's where we're going today in Daniel. Babylon, it is located in modern day Iraq and it's about 60 miles south of Baghdad. You also may know Babylon as another place in Bible back in Genesis 11. The Tower of Babel. You see, this is where the plains, the land of Shinar is, is located, and that's where Babylon is, and that, that's its current location of where it was even today. Babylon has always been and will always be a place of contra controversy and idols. It has always and will always be a place of antagonism against the God of the universe until Christ returns, and this is where the southern kingdom was carried off to in exile. However, at the end of 2 Chronicles, the last two verses of 2 Chronicles, the writer of Chronicles says this, Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by, by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, this pagan king, so that he made a proclamation through all his kingdom and also put it in writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth, the Lord... God of heaven has given me, and he has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah, who is among you of all his people. May the Lord his God be with him and let him go up. Now listen, we, we've got this horrible history of Israel just abandoning, committing spiritual adultery against God. And in here, when he sends them off into exile, God already has planned through King of Persia, Cyrus, to, to bring them back, God's chosen people back. It's a word that tells us today that God is one still in control of things that even seem evil, that seem out of control. God is still in control. He's in control of this King Cyrus. I mean, King Cyrus, King of Persia. He tells us that God will do what he says and he's going to do it. It says that God wants us, no matter how much we turn away, that we run away, that we flee and turn our backs and abandon God. No matter what, God wants us. He desires us to be in a relationship with him and that God makes a way to have that relationship. And all of that, because that's where Israel is, the southern kingdom is in Babylon, and that's where Daniel takes place. All of this brings us to Daniel 1. And in Daniel 1, we see six things to encourage us today as we go throughout this chapter. First off, we see what's called the great defection. Look at Daniel 1, verses 1 and 2. He says, In the third king of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And listen to this. Powerful words right here. Start at verse 2. And the Lord gave, and the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his gods. 605 B.C., Jerusalem fell to Nebuchadnezzar. Two more deportations happened in 597 B.C. and 587 B.C., and only a few remained in the broken and burnt city of Jerusalem, the poor, the aged, and the sick. And these two verses right here, especially there that I said, and the Lord gave, these two verses introduce us to the theme of the book of Daniel. It's the sovereignty of God. No matter what it looks like and no matter what's going on, you see that God is in control. God gave Israel and handed them over to Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar. God's in control of Cyrus, king of Persia. God is in control. Nothing happens outside of his control and his knowledge. And God is still in control of his, of his creation. No one can ever take the throne from him, and God is never going to surrender it to anybody. And now listen, just like the Assyrians were God's instrument of discipline against the northern kingdom in 722 B.C., Babylon was God's instrument of discipline against the southern kingdom in 605 B.C. for their 
just basically turning their backs and abandoning God. God had warned the nation of Israel over and over and over and over again through the prophets what would happen if they did not turn back to him. And the nation would not listen and would not turn back to him. And let me tell you something. This continues still today. So many times, people within the church, people outside the church, we are just like the people of Israel. We turn our back and abandon our God. You know, our God, we don't have to ask where God's gone. He's in the same place at all times. He's everywhere. He's in control. He loves you and he wants to have the relationship. God is there. It's us that move away from God. We're the ones that need to move back to God. He doesn't move, need to move closer to us. We need to move to him. And that's still going on today that people are turning their back on God. People, listen, people want to do life their own way. They want to do what they want to do, that when they want to do it, how they want to do it, and with whom they want to do it. That's our world today. It's the same world that Daniel lived in 2,000, 3,000 years ago. They do, as the book of Judges says, what is right in their own eyes. They do not want to do what the life, the way, the designer has designed life. And this is the great defection. It's Israel. It's people turning their back on God, which brings us to the second point today. It's the great deportation. And so, since the people, the nation of Israel, have decided to turn their back and abandon God, for the next 70 years, because of this, they remained in Babylon beginning in 605 B.C. Now, why is the 70 years so important? You go back to Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, especially Exodus and Leviticus, Every seventh year, the nation of Israel was commanded that the land God gave them was to have a year's rest, a Sabbath rest. So six years, you plant your crop. On the seventh year, you don't do anything. You don't worry about it. God's going to provide. You trust in God's provision. And then it picks up. And there were some other things that went on with the sabbatical year. The land missed, listen to this, the land missed 70, 70 sabbath years israel failed for 490 years to observe this every seventh year and so god god warned them he told them so god gave the land rest for 70 years by sending them out of the land but god also promised remember at the end of second chronicles the last two verses of second chronicles god also promised that at the end of 70 years he would bring israel back so guess what? We're in Daniel, and one of the prayers that we're going to see as we get, not today, but another time in this series, we're going to see Daniel not reminding God, but, remind, but saying, look, God, you said this. You're faithful and true to your word. Is it time to do it, God? Because it's been almost 70 years. And God promised, and, and you're going to see Daniel pray about that. Not only were the people taken during the great deportation. But so were the things of the house of God. Listen again to parts of verse 2. With some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, talking about Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. Now listen to this. A hundred years before this, about 100, 150 years before this, King Hezekiah, king of the southern, southern kingdom, king of Judah, he foolishly showed these treasures in the house of God there in Jerusalem to a group of Babylonian visitors. And Isaiah, if you go back and look at the story, Isaiah warned the king that one day that these same visitors from Babylon would return and take these things in 2 Kings 20. What would happen is Nebuchadnezzar would come take them, eventually exile the people as God had said, and eventually, Cyrus of Persia, the king of Persia, eventually would return many of these items when the captivity ended. And we see that in Ezra chapter 1. This was a move by Nebuchadnezzar to show Israel that the Babylonian gods were stronger and that Yahweh was too weak to save them. Then, from the people that were taken, Nebuchadnezzar ordered some of the young men to be trained in the ways of uh, of, of the Babylonian ways, and we see this in verse 3 and 4 here in Daniel 1. Then the king instructed Asphanes, the master of his eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles, young men in whom there was no blemish, but good-looking, gifted in all wisdom, possession, knowledge, 
and quick to understand, who had the ability to serve in the king's palace and whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. Listen, here's what's going on. You ready for this? Verse five says that these that are chosen, that they are to be educated for three years in the ways of the Chaldeans, the Babylonian ways. And guess what? Daniel and his three friends, they're chosen. We're going to talk about them in just a second. Can you imagine today applying for a job that had a three-year application process and a job that you really didn't want in the first place that you're forced to take? That's what Daniel and his friends are forced to do. They're, they're forced to apply for a job that had a three-year training program that they didn't want in the first place. And listen again to the requirements. All they had to be nobles and descendants of the kings of Judah. All four, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. They were all from the family line of King Zedekiah, the last king of Judah. Youth referred to 14 to 17 year olds. These, the, the, these four that we're going to read about throughout the book of Daniel, they're nothing but a bunch of middle and high schoolers. They're supposed to be good looking, intelligent, wise, quick to understand, able to function socially because they would be in the king's palace working and serving the king. They were to be taught in all the ways of Babylon and all their pagan ways. And the purpose, the purpose was to completely transform them from their former ways, everything that they knew, their life and their culture into full fledged Babylonian citizens, which was something that happened very common throughout history. And it's still done at times today. It was to make them forget everything about who they were and about who Yahweh was. And this was done in three, three ways. First off, these men that were chosen, they were emasculated. They were robbed as their role, of their role as men in Jewish culture, as men created and designed by the God of the universe in his image. Second, they were obligated to eat and drink of the king's provisions. And this was to make them completely dependent on the king of Babylon. And third, listen to this. This is, this is what happened to them because you know their names were changed. They were given names that were affiliated with, with Babylonian gods. Verse 7. I'm not going to read it, but you can look at it. Daniel in the Hebrew. It means God is my judge. When Nebuchadnezzar changed Daniel's name into Belshazzar. And what Belshazzar means, you ready for this? It means Bel protected his life. It was the same with Daniel's three friends, Hananiah and Mishael. Hananiah was changed to Shadrach. Mishael was changed to Meshach. And that Ak at the end of their names is the Babylonian god Aku. And then Azariah was changed to Abednego. Now, Nego was the Babylonian god Nebo. You see, the goal was to get them to forget everything about Jerusalem, forget everything about who they were, and God said they were to forget everything about Yahweh. And the great thing that we see here in Daniel 1, we're getting ready to go into, is right from the start, these four guys that we read about, when they were first chosen for this three-year training period that they didn't want, we see a steadfast commitment to the Lord from these four, which brings us to the next point, the great decision. You see, from the very beginning, and I know you feel it too, from the very beginning, these four, they felt a great pressure to turn their back on God. Listen to what verse 5 says. And the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank in three years of training for them, so that at the end of that time, they might serve before the king. This food and drink that they were to eat, it would not have met the Jewish standards set forth by God in Leviticus 11 and would have been dedicated as offerings to idols and false gods. And Daniel and his friends, they right from the beginning, right from the start, they refuse to do anything that would defile them or, or cause them to turn their back on God. Listen to verse 8 here. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Listen, I want you to get how bold and how courageous and how in our world this seems so crazy of a decision for Daniel and his three friends. The decision did not just jeopardize 
Daniel's life. It, it jeopardized the life of his three friends that were coming along with him. And it jeopardized the chief eunuch that was put in charge of them. Aspenaz, the chief eunuch, said this in verse 10. And the Daniel, to said it to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who has appointed your food and drink. For why should he see your faces looking worse than the young men who are your same age? Then you would endanger my head before the king? Listen, listen. You've been taken captive by the most powerful nation and empire in the world at this time, Babylon. You've been taken captive. You know why you've been taken captive. You've been chosen unwillingly by the enemy to enlist in a three-year training program that you don't want any part of. You don't just deny the king's command. Not only is your life in danger, Daniel, but so are your three friends and other people. This great decision, it's another reminder to us that the decisions that we make today, they have impacts on more than just our life. They impact the lives of everybody around you. What would happen today, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters? What would happen today if the people of God would purpose in their hearts not to defile them th themselves with the things of the world? What would purpose in their hearts that they would walk in a manner worthy? of their calling like I talked about last Sunday. This is the great decision. And, and, and it leads to the great request of Daniel and his friends. Listen to the request in verses 8, 11 through 13. But Daniel purposed in his heart. Daniel made up his mind from the very beginning. He was not going to be defiled. In verse 11, so Daniel said, verse 12, please test your servants for 10 days and let them Give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance be examined before you. And the appearance of the young men, these other guys that you have brought into this training program that don't want to be here either. Then examine their appearance, appearance of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacy. And, and see, and as you see fit, so deal with it, your servants. Deal with us. Fine then. For the next 10 days, give us what we're asking for. And in 10 days, re-examine us. And then examine us in comparison to the other guys over here that don't want to be here either that are eating of the king's stuff. And, and, and when you see it, you do what you see is fit. And notice the manner here of Daniel's request. I love it. Daniel's manner was not rude. It was courteous and respectful. It wasn't blunt, blunt but it was bold. It wasn't confrontational but mutually beneficial for all involved. It allowed for the chief unit to be open and receptive, unlike how many people today respond. What would happen today if we would take the example of Daniel and we would respond boldly with kindness and love? Maybe, just maybe, we wouldn't see BC and on, on news stations and then seeing the news headlines about all these protests and all these different things and how Democrats and Republicans and all these other people are just constantly at their throats. Maybe, just maybe, we would be able to sit down and have conversations about things we disagree on. Maybe we could actually resolve our differences. Remember, Paul says in Romans 12, 18, if it is possible, as much as depends on you, depends on me, live peaceably, with all men. The one in, in charge of Daniel and his friends agreed to this in verse 14. And 10 days later, we see the result of Daniel's proposal in the great demonstration. Verse 15 says this, at the end of 10 days, their features, listen, appeared better and, and fatter in flesh than all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies. They were healthier. They were stronger. They had greater alertness than the other youth that were in the same three-year training period. Their appearance was superior in every way. God clearly rewarded the steadfast conviction. And let me tell you something. God will reward you when you set your heart to walk in a manner worthy of your calling. And I don't mean with health and prosperity. God's going to carry you and be with you. And he's going to do what he says he's going to do through you to accomplish his purposes and his will. And at the end of the three-year training period, listen to what is said about these four in verses 17 through 20. As for these young men... 
God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now at the end of days, at the end of the three years, when the king had said that they should be brought in, the chief eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. Now listen. Then the king interviewed them, and among all, them all, none was found, like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore, they served, not just in the courts, they served before the king. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers who were in his realm, everybody, the ones that were in the three-year training program, the magicians, the sorcerers, everybody. These four guys, because they made up their mind to follow God and not defile themselves with things that have been, with anything of the world, they were found better than all of them. And the influence of these four over the next 70 years that we're going to read about in the book of Daniel is beyond imagination. Listen, Daniel rose to the highest level in the government. He was made ruler over the, ba over the Babylonian province and chief administrator. He continued to serve, listen to this, as many as 13 kings after Nebuchadnezzar, many of which considered him his friend, their friend. He was made the chief executive over the Babylonian kingdom. And many of these kings, even though they didn't want to hear at times or even liked his advice, they listened to Daniel because of his honesty, because of his integrity, and because of his loyalty. All because 70 years before, here at Daniel 1, Daniel and his friends made up their mind. They were not going to let the world defile them. And why was Daniel made great in the midst of the most perverted and evil kingdom ever known? It was because of Daniel and his friends' great loyalty and devotion to God, which is the final point. Listen, verse 21 says this. Remember where we started. Three years in, first, before the, even before the three years, they're chosen, they're carried off in exile. They're chosen for a training program, an application, a job that they didn't want, and they had to do it. They defied the king, and, and they asked, made a, a civil request to not defile themselves with things that they couldn't eat. And then for the next 70 years, listen to where all this ends up for Daniel. Verse 21, thus Daniel continued until the first year of King of Cyrus, King of Persia. Listen, Daniel lived to see Cyrus to be King of Persia and come in and conquer the Babylonian Empire in 539 BC. He was carried off into deportation in 605 BC. 66 years of captivity at this point for Daniel. And Daniel was now over 80 some years old. And it's important to see a major point in this story. Listen to this. Because I know some of you are going through the trial. Some of you are going through the fire right now. God never delivered Daniel from out of Babylon. Instead, in the midst of the most evil and crooked kingdom at this time, the most powerful, God protected, and God strengthened Daniel in the midst of some of the most powerful and evil kingdoms to ever exist. And this is a huge promise for you and me that we got to claim hold of. God promises his people that we can have peace, that we can have joy in him in the middle of life's most trying circumstances as we remain faithful to who he is and his word. As we walk in a manner worthy of our calling. As Paul says in Ephesians 4.1. And this isn't a promise to have wealth and good health. It's a promise. You ready? It's a promise that when the world throws its worst at us, when things just look like there's no way out, to sustain us in the middle of life's most difficult and trying times. Daniel and his friends continued to serve God without wavering because they made up their mind in Daniel 1, right at the very beginning of the deportation. They made up their mind that they were not going to let the world and other things defile them. And they were not going to let the circumstances of the world catch their attention. They were going to keep their focus and their attention on God and God alone. And Daniel said, look. We may be exiles, we may be foreigners in this land, but we are his beloved children. And the question becomes this, how, how did 
Daniel claimed the promise to sustain him in that evil and wicked generation. It's the same way we do today, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters. Listen to me closely. First off, I've already said it a hundred times. It takes conviction. They made up their mind from the beginning. What would happen today if the church that Jesus Christ shed his blood for? What would happen today if the church made up their mind that they were not going to defile themselves with the things of the world? That they were going to praise and worship God no matter what circumstances come their way. Number two, I, I've said this a hundred times. There is no such thing as an independent Lone Ranger Christian. If you're a Christian that's sitting at home today and say that you can worship Christ and worship God without ever being around his people, you're lying to yourself. Hear me closely on that. It takes the right companions. You need to be around the right people. Daniel surrounded himself with true godly friends to pray and support him. And we can't live this life on our own either. We need to surround ourselves with godly men and women to walk with us through the difficult times and the trying times. And then third, I love it. It takes calmness and it takes courage. Not once throughout the book of Daniel do you see Daniel or any one of his three friends ever panic. Ever. They didn't stress out. They didn't look at the circumstances and things going on around them. They focused in on God. And when they had questions, when they had doubts, they hit their knees. Calmness and courage. Listen, when Daniel didn't know what to do, he knew what to do. And that was to hit his knees. And when God told him what to do, what the next step was, Daniel and his friends, they did it. And they stayed calm and courageous knowing that God's got their back. And that's what we need to do today. Do the next thing that God has placed before you. And if you don't know what it is, keep praying. And then fourth, we say it all the time, it takes faith. Listen, none of this, everything that I've talked about, everything that we see in Daniel, everything that we need to be, it's not going to take place. It's not going to happen unless we are in a deep, intimate, loving relationship with the God of the universe. It takes faith. Of knowing who he is. It takes faith that God's going to do what he says he's going to do. And Daniel never panicked, never overreacted. He remained poised and peaceful. And he obeyed and trusted God all the way into the end. It takes faith. And the only way that you're going to have that is getting with God. Setting that time apart. Getting into his word. Hearing from God. Being among his people. It takes faith. Without knowing who God is and that he's a good, loving God that's faithful to his word, you're never going to do what God wants you to do. There are lots of people that come in our churches each and every Sunday. They come because they have to or because they always have or their family goes there. Listen, you come to church to worship God and to be in that relationship with him together among his people. Then you go out in the world each and every day. You get yourself prepared each and every day studying his word and getting as close to God as you can through the blood of Jesus Christ. And if you don't do that, your faith is going to waver. It's going to be up and down. And maybe it's time for us as the church in the 21st century to take a lesson from Daniel today. And here's the lesson from Daniel 1 for us. Listen closely. Conviction, companions, calmness and courage. It takes faith. We got to make up our mind. And here's the lesson. Satan doesn't know what to do with people like this. Satan doesn't know what to do with people like this. But let me tell you something. God does. God does, and, and he will use people like this, people that walk in a manner worthy of our calling in a mighty and powerful way for the good of others and the glory of his great name. So today, ladies and gentlemen, my, my, my word to you is very simple. Make up your mind right now from the beginning. Make up your mind to stand and follow God in his ways. And then when you do that, let me tell you something. You need to surround yourselves with godly men and women. And when the circumstances of life and the trials of life come, in, come, come at you, wave after wave after wave, whatever it may be, stay calm and courageous. And if you don't know what to do, just drop to your knees and pray to God and let God strengthen your faith. Listen, if there's ever a day that we need to trust and rely on the blood of Jesus Christ and make up our mind that he is worthy. 
Today is the day, and today is the day that we need to decide, we need to make up our minds that we're not going to let this world defile us or dictate what we are going to do as the body of Christ. So brothers and sisters, today is the day. Make up your mind. Surround yourself with godly men and women. Stay calm. Be courageous. And I promise you, as you do those things, God is going to build you up and strengthen you in your faith where you have weakness. Because I don't know about you, we're all weak in some way. So my prayer today is very simple. Church, it's a body of Christ. I don't care if you're part of Mount Hebron or part of some other church watching in today. My prayer today is, let's brothers and sisters, let's make up our mind that we're not going to let the world defile us and tell us what to do. That is my prayer today. Is that we stand up as a body of Christ. Father, we love you, we thank you. We praise and honor you. And Father, I know today there, there, there may be some that have made decisions whether to follow Jesus Christ or not. Some today that have already decided to follow Jesus Christ are saying, look, I have not done this. I need to do this. And I pray today that you give them the strength, as they say, as we proclaim as a body of Christ today, that we stand up and we will not be defiled by this world, that we make that decision right here, right now. But Father, I just pray that you give us the comfort and the peace that we need to go out into the world to share your name and glory. Father, I pray that you strengthen our faith because we're going to need it because things are going to happen. Things are going to come our way. But Father, just strengthen our faith in you. And Father, never, ever let us forget that when we don't know what to do, we already know what to do, and that's to look up to you. Father, I love you. We praise you. And we just want to honor and glorify you in everything we do. And it's your son's precious and holy name that we pray. Amen. Again, thank you for being here today. If you need somebody to talk to or made some type of decision, call me. Number's on Facebook page. Um, you can give me a call, send me a text, send me an email, whatever you need to do. I'll be glad to talk to you. But I just want to say right now, today's the day. Let's stand up and go today, church. Love you. Have a great rest of your week. Get your prayer request to me. I'll try to get it called out this afternoon. Love y'all.